Okay, I don't see Chad or Jaren. Okay, so announcements before we get started. Um, hey, obviously you can read, but the pre-professional club led by Chardé is sponsoring free yogurt, frozen yogurt at Yogurtini. Is that the correct time, 2.30 to 4.30? Yeah. Okay, so if you have paid your dues, then go join Chardé and get yourself some yummy ice cream. Um, those of you who are pre-med, Dr. Roddy will be on campus the first Monday after spring break. And she'll have an informational meeting in the evening at 6 p.m. in the amphitheater with food. So if you're interested in medicine, that. If you're interested in the Loma University School of Pharmacy, um, Linda Williams and oh, Andrew Hegland will be here on March 30, and they will also have a meeting with food at 6 p.m. in the Lang Amphitheater. Lang Amphithe Amphitheater is room 200 here in Kruger Center. And finally, if you are applying for pre-professional school, medical school, dental school, whatever, for um, applying this summer so that you could start school a year from this summer, right, start in 2007, fall 2007, then you need to get a recommendation from the pre-professional committee. And the pre-professional committee had, well, we're going to meet after March 17, but has the application deadline of March 17. So if you are pre-professional and are going to be applying this summer to go to pre-professional school in a year, then make sure you go up to Darla and get the forms to fill it out so we can give the official recommendation. Most pre-professional schools, at least they say, they won't accept a student if they don't get the letter from the pre-professional committee. I say at least they say because what you say and what you do is not always the thing. Okay. We are going to, you had a question? Yeah, um, I was going to, I had a request. A request. Okay, uh, in light of recent events of exam scores, would we be able to have on Monday a review session, like, and then it's like, how last semester, how was like highlighted, what uh, was on the test, and mm -hmm. work through, something like that? I, I, will, I will do that, yeah, because I, I was devastated with the scores of the last test. Okay. And, I'll yeah. Test <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. okay. okay, moving on. So we're talking now about light. And one of the things that's cool about light is we can often treat light as if it's a ray. So we're going to talk about geometric optics primarily today, which is treating light as a ray. Now we're going to use Huygens principle, I think that's Christian's correct pronunciation for his name, Christian Huygens, to understand why we can treat light as a ray. Let's make sure we're into this mathematically. What does a ray mean? Okay. There, there is a, a key difference to what she said, and it's generally lost on everyone like me. A line has no starting or ending point. A ray has starting point, no ending point. So our ray model is treating light as if it has a starting point, no ending point, unless it hits something. And it's just going to travel in a state, straight path. Now, when light hits something, there are really three things that can happen, two of them that I have listed here. It can reflect, which means it bounces off. So if I have a ball and I throw the ball and it hits the floor, we can say it reflected off the floor, right? It bounced off the floor. That's what reflection means. Or it can be transmitted through the material. It could go through. <laughs> if I throw the ball at the window, it could be <laughs> transmitted. I would hope not, but when I was a child, I had to pay to replace a window in the house because, yeah, it was not reflected appropriately, transmitted. Now, it can also be absorbed. When light hits something that is black, it's black because the light didn't reflect off of it. So these tabletops are absorbing most of the light that hits them. That's what makes them black. If you have a white shirt, 
Don't see him with the white shirt. You're just as close as they're going to come. Oh, uh, yeah, well. <laughs> we do not ask you to disrobe to display your white shirt. <laughs> um, yeah, it's I, I know it would have been appropriate, but yet it seems inappropriate. <laughs> and I don't want any sense of impropriety. Um, if you have a white shirt, it's reflecting all of the light because we have white lights in the room. True yet funny story. This morning, I opened the closet, randomly took out, well, not randomly, I took out pants first and said, okay, well, we'll go with these pants. And I looked at this shirt and I'm all, ah, I like that. It's just white and gray and black. And I put up my bag and went to the gym. And then at the gym, after taking a shower, I look at my clothes, I'm all, that is not white and gray and black. There's clearly some green color to this. Why was I confused at home? <clears throat> this has happened multiple times. I get a shirt that looks brown and pants that look green, and then I go to the gym and I find that they're the same color. No, I'm not colorblind. If, if I was colorblind, I would not find the difference. Different it's because of the light in our closet. The light in our closet is not really white. White is what we call light when we have all of the colors pretty evenly mixed together. But clearly, the light in my closet is missing some green. And since it didn't have the green, the green didn't get reflected from my shirt because it wasn't there. And so I just saw this with the blue and red put together, which, well, a little green, but the green was subdued. It just looked black and white. And so I had the colors wrong because white is reflecting all the colors. If there's no green, you, know, you don't reflect the green because it's not there. We'll talk more about color theory, but it's kind of important to know light can be transmitted, reflected, or absorbed. Now... I think Huygens' principle. Okay, wavefront and Huygens' principle. When we have light, light is a wave. What kind of wave is light? Electromagnetic. Electromagnetic, right? That's pretty much all you know about it at this point. Light is an electromagnetic wave. It's a wave of alternating electric fields to magnetic fields. And so, since it is a wave, it should have the same types of properties as other waves. So we've studied... Waves on a string, for instance. So the things we've learned about waves on a string will apply to light waves, for the most part. There is one important thing that does not apply. A wave on a string, you have to have a string there. And so when scientists early on were studying light and treating light like a wave, they said, well, like other waves, it must be traveling through something. Well, very quick experimentation shows that while if you have a vacuum chamber, a chamber with nothing in it, sound doesn't go through it, light does. And so they said, well, there must be something in this vacuum chamber where we've removed everything. There's still some kind of medium for light to go through. And so they called this medium the ether. So it's called the ether theory, that there is this medium. And then scientists did lots of experiments to try to learn more about the ether. That's what scientists do. They don't know something about it. They come up with a theory, it makes a prediction, if you do this, you should see something. So they did things like measure the speed of light going this direction and measure the speed of light going this direction. If the ether has some kind of velocity, you'll see a different speed one direction compared to the other. Well, they didn't see any difference, no matter what they did. So you go on the road, you know, put it on the back of the train, see if you get a difference. No difference. Finally, scientists had to give up the ether theory and they said it must not require a medium. So our understanding now for light is that light doesn't require a medium. Light will travel through a vacuum. What is a vacuum? Absence of things. Absence of things. Empty space. Light will go through empty space. And in fact, light travels the fastest through empty space. So the speed of light in empty space we call C. Other materials have a slower speed. Every other material has a slower speed. And you can actually understand this with a very basic... Did you guys spill a lot of liquid nitrogen last night? No, I wouldn't say a lot. <laughs> Is there any left? A small to me. Oh, yeah, there's quite a bit. Okay. <laughs> um, the floor's clean. 
<laughs> yeah, the floor is clean. Except in the corner. Except for in the corner where I see a whole bunch. <laughs> yes. They were working really nice. Sorry, off the point. Um, we can think of light traveling through something that's not a vacuum as electrum, electric fields oscillating. I just generally focus on the electric field. It has electric field and magnetic field. But you can just focus on one. And if the electric field comes to an atom, the electrons in the atom are going to respond to the electric field. Remember, an electric field puts a force on a charge. And so that electric field comes, it puts a force on the charge, and makes the charge move in response to that electric field. And then that moving charge, it absorbs the light, but then it gives it back because it's moving. It's acting like the dipole antenna we started with. And so it's re-emitting. So it's absorbing and re-emitting the light. And it takes some time for that to happen. And so that's why light slows down when we go through anything that's not a vacuum. Okay. <laughs> I, I keep going off topic and I have 30-odd slides. This is a bad sign. When light is traveling, I said we can treat it kind of like we would water waves. So here's what happens if you drop a pebble in a pond. You see something like that. That looks familiar, right? Tell me what's happening in that picture. You have waves, and what are the waves doing? Okay, they're moving out from the center. So if I look here, what direction is the velocity of the wave right there? The, the red dot. It's going out. What about here? Okay, we'll just say out everywhere. And so the wave's moving out at all points. So it's expanding outward. This is on a flat surface. Light is usually traveling through three-dimensional space, but it's still going out everywhere. And so light expands into a spherical shape. So I think on the next slide, I'll have pictures, spherical wavefronts, as we call them. Well, the, the word wavefront is what I really want to focus on for this slide. So we have these ripples or waves and you look and you can see, okay, here is the high point on the wave right here. Okay, I got off. This is the best of my artistry, folks. So there's the high point of that wave going around in a circle. It looks oblong because we're at an angle. If you look, that's a high point, but there are other high points as well. And so we can treat each high point as a, what we call a wave front. We can say, okay, waves are continuous, right? It's going like this. But I'm going to treat the peaks as specific points and say, here's where one wave is, its wave front, where the peak is. Here's the next one where its peak is. What's the separation between those peaks? The wavelength. We have a simple name for it. The wavelength is the different distance between those peaks. So we have these wave fronts that are each one separate from the next one by one wavelength. And then those wave fronts are traveling outward. What is the direction of the travel compared to the wave front surface? Look at my picture. They're perpendicular. Man, Sally's on top of this, y'all. <laughs> so the velocity is perpendicular to the wave front. If it's a two-dimensional wave front, if it's a three-dimensional wave front, for instance, light coming away from a flashlight, then instead of being perpendicular, it's normal to the surface. So the wave fronts and the velocity are, you know, velocity is normal to the wave front. So we're going to use that to help us understand how light propagates. Propagates means travels. So here are some pictures of wave fronts. The first picture is looking at what you might have on a flat surface like the ripples on a pond. And so the ripples on a pond, you have the waves that are just going out in circles. And so the wave fronts are just the circles. If it was a flashlight instead, the second, well, the second one that is circular in nature, is trying to depict the light going out in spherical shells. 
that's why you have all the fuzzy stuff there. It's trying to indicate that it's spherical shells, not just circles. Now, I could also, on a pond, if I use something like a board and I push that board forward and backward, or even if I have a log and the log I raise and lower, I can make waves that travel so that they're all going the same direction. So I have parallel waves. We can do the same thing with light. And so if we had parallel waves on the water, then our wave fronts are making parallel lines. The velocity is perpendicular to the wave fronts. And so we have a picture that should, there that shows the straight line wave front with the velocity in blue. We can do the same thing in three dimensions. We can make a planar wave front. So planar wave front is just the three dimensional equivalent of the two dimensional having the lines moving out. Now I haven't talked about Huygens, whoops, I went in the wrong direction there. I haven't talked about Huygens principle yet, so I think, actually we have this question and then we'll talk about Huygens principle. Um, come on. There we go. Took a long time to get started. You may now answer. What is the spacing between adjacent wave fronts? Annie, you are right. So are you, Michaela. Just, you know, giving affirmation to my first people. I do worry a little. I was very clear on this. It's one wavelength between the wave fronts. I don't know how we one would have come up with three eighths. One half I could kind of see, but the wave fronts are going from, I use the example of going from peak to the peak again. Now it only has to be separated by one wavelength so you can choose a different location. But it's easiest to go peak to peak. Which is one wavelength separation. Sorry, you have a question? Okay. Now I believe we'll talk about Christian Huygens' theorem. So, what Christian Huygens said, his principle, excuse me, not theorem. What Christian Huygens said was, you know what? I think we can take a wave front, now that we've defined what a wave front is, and we can treat each point on that wave front, which means we'll have an infinite number of points, as if it is a little light source, or wave source if it's a water wave, a little source for water wave. And then one period later, I will have all of these sources that produce waves that come out, and I'll add them all together. And when I add them all together, I will get my new wave fronts. So basically, if I have a wave front that's something traveling like this, I say, okay, I'm going to take each point on that wave front, And if I'm drawing a two-dimensional picture, in what way does the light go out from a point? In a circle, if I'm treating it, treating it one-dimensionally. So I'm going to have circles that, in theory, would all be the same length or radius coming from each one of these. And then I add these all together, and I find that when I add them all together... Uh-oh. I need to change my tool. I have a new wave front that has moved forward. Now, in reality, of course, there would be a new one that comes back here. But if we're just talking about no reflection, we ignore the backward moving wave front. We just look at the forward moving wave front. So Christian Huygens' principle allows us to figure out what's going to happen as a wave propagates by treating each point on the wave front as if it's a source. Now this makes really good sense in conjunction with what I said about why light goes slower in something other than a vacuum. If you have light going through something other than a vacuum, what's happening? Constantly absorbed and re-emitted. So this is actually what's happening if it's going through, through something other than vacuum. So Christian Huygens principle really makes good sense. Ah, 
Now, I have do you question? Yeah, like how come as the wave that's the waves go out farther than they're more thick, that they're not like more thick than they're going the same speed. Say that again? You know how like ripples they slowly okay. Is it just like they've lost their speed over time all at the same point or like how they get thicker towards the outside? Um <clears throat> if you have something like a pond, the waves will get smaller as you go farther away because the energy has to be spread out over a larger, larger distance. And so the energy which manifests as the height of the wave is getting less and less for each little, you know, one inch segment. And thus the height is smaller, which makes it look more spread out because it's not going as high. Okay, this is just a little website that has what I consider a nice little description of how Huygens principle works. So we have somebody dropping a pedal, a pebble, and you see the wave going out. Now you drop a bunch of them, and you see how the little circles add up to give you the new wave front going out. Make more sense than my drawing, right? Question, Sally? Um, the, the Huygens principle does exactly this when it's not in vacuum. When it's in vacuum, it still allows you to determine what's going to happen, but it's not constantly being reabsorbed and emitted. How does this make this lower in not vacuum again? How's what? How does it, how does this make, um, Well, the, the process of the light being stopped and started again, there's a time delay between the stop and start again. Okay, moving forward, everyone's seeing him drop enough pebbles. Now we have a wave going through a barrier. You have a harbor, and you want to stop waves through the harbor, so you put up something like this. And you can see the waves that go straight through the opening continue on. What do they do with the size of the opening? They get smaller and they bend around. That bending is called diffraction. And so it diffracts the light bends. We tend to not think of light bending. We do think of sound bending. I go outside the door, I can stand in the middle of the hallway, and you can hear me because the light will bend around. But you can't see me, or the light, the sound, will bend around. You can't see me, you tend to think the light doesn't bend, but it does. Now let's look at Huygens' principle applied to this. So the wave comes, acts like a whole bunch of little sources, and you can see the new wave fronts forming because of those little sources. Yes, ma'am? I just don't understand how there's not like interference between all of those things. Well, they are, there is. Okay. And so you add it all up to get the total. And when you get the total, the places, um, there is no way to actually freeze this, but the places where they're not all on top of each other, you have on average as much up as down some places, so it adds up to zero. Some places they have a little bit more up than down, and so it's not flat. You have a wave, you can't see if I draw something, but a wave that's actually going like this. And only where you see them all coming together is at the highest point. So there, there are certain places where it adds to zero, other places where it adds a little positive, other where it adds a little negative. Okay, and <laughs> this, I don't see how it's different, but... Oh, it's just it added shading on there to show you the bending around. So that is one little demonstration. Here's another one, one that I actually didn't get running until just before my other class, so I haven't had a chance to play with. Um, this is allowing us to look at what happens when light hits a surface. Um, actually, since I didn't play with it, <laughs> I'm not going to use it today. I didn't have time because it wouldn't work in my office. I brought it out here. Finally got started like one minute before my previous class started. So let's go back to the regular presentation. And talk about geometric optics. Now, when is geometric optics appropriate? Right? It's not always appropriate. It's only appropriate some of the time. So. When is it appropriate? It's appropriate when you have the size of objects and apertures are large compared to the wavelength. 
if that's not true, then the bending of light around corners, the diffraction is going to be a significant issue. But if the, if the sizes of things are large compared to the wavelength, then we can treat it as if it's just going straight line. And so let's get started. First, and I have to raise the, the screen here to talk about some things. We're going to talk about reflection. So here I have a laser. Let me turn off some more lights so the laser is more visible. So I have a laser here, and you can see the laser looks like a line, right? A line with starting and ending points. That's the whole ray idea. It started at the laser point. It continues straight until it hits something. It's reflecting off. And I change this angle, and it changes the reflection. Reflection is pretty simple. Now, this picture here is showing how Huygens' principle predicts what's going to happen when you have light reflecting off of a flat surface. I have light coming down these blue lines. So the black lines are showing the wave fronts that are perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And so the light comes down and it hits the surface. And then using Huygens' principle, of course, the light is going to hit this surface before it hits over here. That is, I should do it on here so you can see it on the YouTube. The light's going to hit here at an earlier time than here because the angle of the wavefront makes it closer. And so it reflects from here earlier, making the returning wavefront tipped away from the direction that it was coming in. So, yeah, the one that says incident is the one coming in. The one that says reflect is the one going out. Incident is the word we use here for incoming light. So we can see here, using Huygens' principle, why things reflect. What if it's not a flat surface? Flat surface, it's all nice and uniform. We call that specular reflection. So specular reflection is mirror-like. When you have specular reflection, the light comes in and reflects off in a very nice, uniform way. And so with a mirror, you can see yourself in it, right? Specular reflections, you can see your reflection because the light is reflected in a uniform way. But if the surface is not smooth, if the surface is rough, like, yeah, then that rough surface is going to cause the light to be reflected in all kinds of random directions. And with the light reflected in all kinds of random directions, you can't see your reflection. We often like that. So like if you go to Dr. Utt's office, she has a what we call frosted coating on the windows. And that frosted coating is just a rough surface. It's transparent, but it's a rough surface so that light gets bounced around in different directions when it hits that surface and you can't see clearly through it, you can't see a clear reflection off of that surface. Now one side is smooth and you can see a clear reflection off of the smooth side. So this here we call a diffuse reflection. See up there? Diffuse. Diffuse because the light gets spread out. Now another clicker question. I think, uh oh. Um, this one here is kind of important. If the size of the pits and holes in a reflective surface are small compared to the wavelength, then you have specular. If the variation of the pits and holes is large, um, well, if the pits and holes yeah, are large compared to the wavelength, then you see a lot of variation. So when you look at the face of a friend, what kind of reflection do you see from his or her skin? Okay, 
we had five, nine, two. What did I use as a descriptor for the difference between a mirror reflection and a diffuse reflection? Okay, smooth versus rough. And if it's a mirror reflection, what do I see? I can see myself in it. So if I come up to Tori and I look in her forehead, I don't see myself. Nobody has skin that smooth. So I don't see myself. Since I don't see myself, I can immediately know that it is not a mirror-like reflection. What do we call a mirror-like reflection? Specular. So it's not a specular reflection. And we haven't talked about phase conjugate reflections. I just put them in there because they're the third kind of reflection. So it's a diffuse reflection. Now people are laughing. Nobody has skin that smooth. You do sometimes see a nice glare off of somebody's skin, right? When you see that glare, you are getting some specular reflection. Why do you suppose that is? Yeah, it's probably sweater oil that has formed a sheen over their skin, making a smooth surface to give you a specular reflection. And so people like me who sweat a lot, you probably can see nice reflections off of my forehead a lot more than off of most people. All right. When we talk about reflections, we are going to measure angle of incidence and angle reflection from the ray to the surface normal. So once again, this word normal has come up over and over in physics. What does the normal mean? Yep. Like perpendicular, but for a 3D situation. So I have the normal to the tabletop is coming up. The normal to this whiteboard is coming straight out toward you. So let's look at a picture here. I know having the screen up makes it a little hard. Actually, probably would be best if I put it to halfway, right? Then you'd have white for the top half and white for the bottom half. Uh, okay, that's not perfect because it's got a black part. Well, we'll live with it. So here is light reflecting. I have an incident ray. I have a reflected ray. One of the things that's really important, this surface normal. Whenever you're doing a problem with geometric optics, you kind of need to identify that surface normal. And your angles are measured in the same plane. So I have a plane that, both the in, that all three of the incident ray, the surface normal, and the reflected ray fall in. So as an example, if I have light coming down like this, my normal is coming straight up, and so my plane has to include those two. So my plane is like this, the light's going to reflect out in the same direction that it went over. It's not going to come in like this and then reflect out toward you or back toward me. Now, based on the geometry that we saw with Huygens' principle, you can do the math. It's really easy, you know. Distance equals velocity times time is all you really need. It turns out that the angle for the incident light, the angle between the surface normal and the incident ray, is equal to the angle for the reflected light, the angle between the surface normal and the reflected ray. So our law of reflections is that simple equation. Now, <clears throat> I have two laws of reflections listed. The first one is this, that the angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. What does incidence mean? Incoming. Incoming. What does reflected mean? <laughs> reflected? <laughs> Going out. The second law is that they're in the same plane, called the, incident, the plane of incidence. So, another clicker question. How is the angle of reflection measured? <laughs> All right. I will I'll raise it up because I'm going to be using this more. It's not that much better, is it? All 
All right, everybody's answered. We had... Seems our distracted students are the same number. The angle of reflection is measured from the surface normal to the reflected red. The key point here is it is not measured from the reflecting surface. That's the big mistake that people make. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the big mistake people make is they try to measure from the reflecting surface instead of from the normal to the surface. And, well, that one there is just the total deviation. So our two laws of reflection summarized. Law number one, angle of instance equals angle of reflection, or as we like to write, just theta i equals theta r. Law number two, the reflected ray lies in the same plane as the incident ray and the surface normal. So they're going to form a plane with those three lines all in them. Okay, actually, yeah, it doesn't work with that. I'm going to lower this, the screen. I know I should have done earlier. How much mirror do we need to see ourselves in the mirror? Now, I don't have a clicker question for you because I have this nice picture that instantly gives you an idea of scale. Yeah, it's not me. If you want to see yourself in the mirror, you stand in front of that mirror, you look at the mirror, let's start with simple things. Where is the light coming from that you see? If, like, let's say I'm standing in front of a mirror, I look and I see my toes. Where's that light coming from? Okay, there are two answers that I generally would have considered okay, and I heard those two answers. From a light source, my toes are not themselves giving off light. They're reflecting light. But I tend to think that it comes from my toes. It really came from a light source, came down, reflected off of my toes. What kind of reflection? Well, I'm, I don't know, I never polish my shoes, so there's not that much specular to it. If I was wearing nice suede shoes, what kind of reflection would I be getting off of those suede shoes? A diffuse reflection. So I have that reflected light coming from my feet. And so the light going from my feet, what direction does the light lead from my shoes? Because they have a rough surface, what direction does it leave? In all directions. So I have the light leaving the feet. Well, okay, it can't go through the foot now, so if it's from the front of the foot, it probably isn't going to go there. But there would be some coming out to the sides. The only ray I'm concerned with, though, is the ray that I can see. And so the ray that I can see is going to be the one that comes from the foot, hits the mirror, and gets to my eye. And so it comes up, what can I say about this angle of incidence compared to this angle of reflection? They're the same. So geometrically, assuming that my body is all in a plane, that is that my body goes, everything in my body is, vertical like that. Obviously, it's not true, right? My belly sticks out more. My you know, knees stick out less. But assuming it's all in the plane, we can do this. So we say, hmm, the distance here, oh, Richard, that was lovely. This here, what was a dashed line that's now solid, is part of two triangles. And this angle is the same for both triangles. And this angle is, oh man, I've taken off that line. This is a right angle on both triangles. So we've probably all taken some amount of geometry and we learned that angle side angle defines a unique triangle. And I have angle side angle is the same for both of these. So these are congruent triangles, which means that this distance here, I'll call this distance here A, and this distance here B, how do those have to compare? They're the same. And so the distance from, of course, this was coming from the top of her foot, but let's pretend it was coming from the bottom of her foot. The distance from the bottom of her foot to the mirror that it hits is the same as the distance from the mirror it hits to my eye or her eye. 
And then I look at the top of the head, I have the same geometry. So I have to look halfway from my eyes to my toes to see my toes. And halfway from my eyes to the top of my head to see the top of my head. So how much total mirror did I need to see my entire body? If it's a height h for the entire body, how much mirror was necessary? Only half of your body height. So I'm like, what, 6263? I only need a mirror that's like three, three feet, one and a half inches, and I can see my entire body. Assuming that my body is in a plane and that it's a horizontal mirror parallel or vertical mirror parallel to me. What happens if I move farther away? No change. Nowhere in this did I talk about how close she was to the mirror. I just said that it's the same distance for both the upper and lower triangles. So if I move closer or farther, it's not going to change how much mirror I need or how much I see. I'll see all of me if I have the same size mirror. It's kind of interesting, right? Now, when you move farther away, what happens to the distance for your image? The image is where it appears to you that you're located. And so you see these rays coming in, and your brain says, well, come back here, and hey, we hit the floor. That must be where my feet were. Just using geometry, your brain figures the distance. And so, of course, once again, using trig, this angle and this angle are the same. And so the distance you are from the mirror is the same as the distance from the mirror to where the image is you're viewing. And so the distance from you to the image is twice the distance from you to the mirror. When you move farther away, what does that do to the distance? It increases the distance. And so you see less detail because, of course, you're looking at something that appears farther away. Now, just a little word for those who might ever go into installing mirrors. How tall does a mirror need to be like, how high should the tallest part of a mirror be? If you're going to have somebody of a standard, you know, six foot three height looking at it, and they want to see the top of their head. If, if you're six foot three, your eyes are maybe, you know, six feet off the ground, it needs to be like six, one and a half for the top aspect. Now, I know, Ray, you're not a short fella. Did they put the mirrors up that tall? Uh... Not in gas station bathrooms. No. <laughs> Not in hotel bathrooms either. Not in house bathrooms either. I want to see myself in the mirror. i got to do things like this. Right? Because they put those in for midgets. So if you're ever installing these, put the mirrors so we can actually see ourselves. I mean, I want to shave. But I want to shave more than just from here down. Right? <laughs> it, it really drives me crazy. Of course, then there's the shower heads that are this high. Thank you very much. And I'm not even a tall man. Think what it's like for tall people. Okay, here's a question for you. I have myself a, what we call a corner cube mirror. In this case, the mirror is an angle of 90 degrees. How can I find the amount the light has deviated from that mirror? I'm going to have to use geometry, yeah. This is called, ray optics is called geometrical optics because you've got to use geometry a lot. So you would take this and you say, okay, the light comes in. I have an angle of incidence measured from the normal to the surface. And that's going to reflect with that same angle. And so this ray comes off here. And I know that the amount the light has deviated. So the light was initially going like this. How much did it deviate? Um, well, let's go with 180 degrees because, or, or excuse me, if it had gone straight, it would have been zero, right? And from here to here is 180 degrees, but then I had theta 1 and theta 1. So it would be 180 minus 2 theta 1. Yes. Are, are you doubting me? 
Okay, so I had a deviation of 180 degrees minus 2 theta 1. Now the light comes over here. Eh. How big is the angle of incidence on the second surface? How do I find that? Well, the, the way to do it, if it's a 90 degree angle, I think it actually turns out right, but um, the way to do that is say, well, this angle between the mirror and the incident is the same as the angle over there. So that's 90 degrees minus theta 1. Sum of the interior angles of a triangle. What's the sum of the interior angles of a triangle? Yes. So I have 9 degrees minus theta 1 plus 90 degrees for my right angle plus, and then using the same idea, 90 degrees minus theta 2 is equal to the sum of my interior angles, or 180 degrees. And actually, I'm going to change this from being 90 degrees. I'm going to make this phi just so I can have some angle besides 90 degrees between my two mirrors. And so if I take this, 90 plus 90 turns out to be 180. So I could subtract 180 degrees from both sides. And I have minus theta 1 minus theta 2 plus phi equals 0. So theta 2 is equal to phi minus theta 1. And so that tells me what my angle of incidence for the second one is. And then I need to calculate how much deviation I had for the second one. So here would have been straight. There's my deviation. And just like before, that's 180 degrees minus 2 theta 2. And so my total deviation is 180 degrees minus 2 theta 1 plus 180 degrees minus 2 theta 2. 360 degrees, what's that equivalent to? Zero. So I just take these and add them up to 360 and replace 360 with zero. Actually, you know what, I won't do that. The reason I won't do that is because then I have a negative angle, I want to get a positive angle. So 360 degrees minus 2 theta 1 minus 2, and theta 2 is phi minus theta 1. It doesn't matter what theta 1 was, because it adds out to 0. And the amount of deviation is just 360 degrees minus 2 times whatever that angle was. So if that angle was 90 degrees, then it's 180. If it was some other angle, well, then it's not going to come out parallel. Why did I do this? I did it fast, I know, because I wasn't really working for us to be able to reproduce this. But the ideas, the ideas of using your trigonometry knowledge. So when we do this geometrical optics, you're going to be looking at things like this. You might have a situation where you have a four-sided figure. What's the sum of the interior angles for a four-sided figure? 360 degrees. Right, so you use things like that. You've got to pull open your, your geometry knowledge, your trigonometry knowledge, when we get to these things. Oh, goodness. Well, we're ready to talk about refraction, but we are out of time. See you all Monday. Yes?